Today, we're looking at who are the Victorians, which maybe isn't the greatest title uh, for today's course or lecture, but it's really more about what were the people of this period of Victorian Britain experiencing. If you were an average person, middle class, which is something that emerges here in the, in the mid-19th century, if you were part of that middle class, what would your life have been like? Uh, and what would the world around you have been? So today we're going to be looking at in what ways does the life of British people in the mid-1800s change as a direct result of the growing um, pieces of the 19th century. Earlier, we discussed how the Industrial Revolution is well underway by the mid-19th century. And we have things such as industrialization, the growing economic changes that happen as a result of that. But by, but for many people, that's not being their real, real of reality. For, for the majority of folks, they may be working in a factory or they may be in a slum, but their life has not changed tremendously, uh, other than that maybe they work in a factory. But the world around them is certainly changing, and the perspectives that they would have had are influenced by the world in which they lived. So one of the first real ways that people are encountering this new second age of the Industrial Revolution was something called the Great Exhibition. The Great Exhibition was organized by Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, in 1851. Now it was based out of London and it drew millions of people from all levels of society. So here we're not talking necessarily just about the upper classes. We're really talking about every layer of society being invited and involved in this new period of, of, of exhibition. Um, people are, sh are, show are, are interested to see new developments. Now, it's held at something called the Crystal Palace, uh, which was this gigantic building uh, that was made of all glass and steel. Uh, it looked very much like a greenhouse, from what I understand. And that was also another piece of this massive change, right? If you think about Victorian buildings or buildings in England, right, they're very stone structures, uh, grand facades. This is a sleek building made of glass, held up by steel. Uh, you know, the relative um, inexpensive nature of steel had had only really been something that, that came into existence in the mid 1800s. Uh, before this, steel was very expensive and, and you really couldn't use it as a building product. But now in the mid 1800s, that could be the case. And, and you have this building to, to showcase for it. Now it showcases many of the inventions. The first fax machines are showing off here, or at least the technology that will go into them. Uh, the steam engine is brought in so that people can see sort of how it works. Uh, but also other pieces of sort of quote unquote Britishness come into effect here. And you start seeing more pieces of uh, illustrations of sort of, you know, the, the uh, Koh-i-Noor, the largest diamond uh, in the British Empire is showcased here. Um, new jewels, there's jewel, there's Celtic jewelry from Ireland. Ireland is only part of the United Kingdom for 50, 50 years at this point. So this is a period where there's a big illustration of sort of Britain's greatness. And part of that is being exhibited here. The, the Great Exhibition runs for about eight months uh, from May of 1851 through to December uh, of 1851. So, so roughly seven or eight months. And again, millions of people come to this, millions of dollars or pounds 
are raised as a um, fundraiser to, to showcase the greatness here. So again, this is a huge, huge deal that is really showing off the, the life of Britain for, for, for many people. For other people who are involved, there is, there's big political changes. And two such political changes, I'm going to talk about two political parties that are um, that are significant and important to the mid 19th century. And I want to talk about how uh, you know both of these parties don't live through the Victorian era. Both will uh, be dissolved uh, actually quite quite early in, in Victoria's reign. But what the but the importance here is to show that. Uh, sort of what we think of as modern politics is coming out here. So you have the the Whig Party um, that emerges. So the Whig Party is a party that had been around in Britain since the 17th century, since the 1600s. And through the 1700s, the Whigs had been um, very much connected to a constitutional monarchy, not necessarily associated with the absolute monarchy, that had existed um, in, uh, let's say, the, let's say in other countries or, or earlier. The most important member of the Whig Party is a person named Lord Melbourne. Maybe not the most important, but one of the important people, uh, Robert Walpole, who was really the first Prime Minister, um, is, is involved with the Whig Party. But Lord Melbourne is important because uh, he is a close ally and close friend of Queen Victoria. Uh, and when she wrote Rises to the Throne in the late 1830s, 1837, he is the prime minister uh, who helps her out. And he really helps her rehabilitate the monarchy. They're a very close relationship. Um, uh, their very close relationship is... Um, indicative of of the Whig sort of attachment to the monarchy again the monarchy that existed because of the glorious revolution uh, which maybe I should talk about at the end of the video um, the other piece to this is that uh, the Whigs were not necessarily associated with sort of high church Anglicanism um, you may have heard about the Anglican Church, the church that was created when King Henry VIII had the Reformation in Britain uh, or England in the 1530s. The 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 Anglican Church was a was a was the the um, established Church of England, meaning that you know uh, the people the high the high ministers of the church held sort of political persuasion. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury was appointed by the queen or the king. Uh, the queen was the head of the church, not you know, the pope as it would be in the Catholic church. Um, and the Whigs you know, were sort of other denominations, more associated with, let's say, Presbyterians or Methodists or Unitarians. In 1832, there was a bill passed called the Reform Act, or the Reform Bill of 1832. We'll talk more about this bill next week, but the Reform Bill opens up new layers of um, representation. It gets rid of what are sometimes called vacant boroughs, which were uh, basically large pieces of land that you know, very few people lived on that had equal representation to larger cities. And one of the things I've been mentioning is that there's larger urbanization. So one of the things that would happen is you'd have these defunct boroughs having the same representation as a growing city like Manchester that had hundreds of thousands of people. And obviously that's not fair, at least in our democratic mind of the 21st century. So there is a shift, and then that, that begins to change here in 1832. The other major political, now the, the Whigs will dissolve into the Liberal Party in the 1850s. The other major political party here is 
um, the Tory party. Now, the Tory party, uh, they have two sort of big characters here. The Duke of Wellington is one who is important as a military leader and, and ultimately as a, as a prime minister. The other major important person here is Robert uh, Robert Peel. Excuse me. Now, Robert Peel uh, will come back to our story when we talk about Ireland and the famine uh, of the 1840s. But Peel is a conservative... Uh, more closely attached to a sort of middling group of aristocracy, uh, sort of not the landed folk, but sort of middle industrialists, people who make their money um, through growing industry. They're devoutly high church Anglican, and more importantly, they are... Um, they are almost not connected to the monarchy. They don't see the idea of of uh, mercantilism. They believe in laissez-faire economics. Uh, basically, let what happens, happens. And, and then again, that will be something that damns uh, Robert Peel in the 1830s. Now, the party, uh, sorry, 1840s. Uh, Robert Peel and the, and the conservatives, the Tories, will ultimately break apart, uh, and there will be a new party that's formed in the 1840s when Peel is back as... Um, Prime Minister called the Conservative Party. So we'll we'll come back to them. There's another big change that happens here, um, called the Representation of the People Act or the Reform Bill of 1867. Gets rid of the defunct boroughs even more uh, as we sort of now are 30 years, 35 years past the previous borough uh, uh, bill. It gets rid of more boroughs that have become defunct. But it also, the really big important piece here is that it, it starts to spread uh, democracy to other people. Um, so we are no longer talking about just landholders who are represented or having the right to vote. Uh, we are now opening that up to people who make seven pounds a year uh, or, you know, um, something like, I think, 46 shillings per month. But what's important to see here is... This is a relatively low bar. Uh, you know, this is something that opens up huge amounts of, of representation. I should also point out that this is not um, this is not um, democratic entirely, right? We're only still talking about something like twenty percent, maybe twenty five percent of the population having the right to vote. But we're also only talking about men, right? Uh, so that obviously eliminates fifty percent of the population having the right to vote. So again, it's not totally democratic. Women in Britain will not get the right to vote until uh, after World War One in 1918, a, a year even before the United States gives it. Um, the other piece here that uh, representation of, of land is, is now given on uh, population. So places like Manchester, Birmingham, old cities that, that had not had equal representation now begin to get equal representation. Education changes in this period as well. We get more educated classes, which your article talks about, um, opening up education to greater swaths of people. Uh, this encourages uh, more younger folk to go to school. Uh, it also makes, in some places, education compulsory so that students under the age of 13 have to go to school. Uh, this opens up education to about 2.5 million people, young people, children, uh, but it also ignores about 2 million people who are, are just not eligible to go to school. It does provide some funding, but this is, again, is not, there, there are certainly good changes. It's just not, you know, a huge democratic or huge massive change. There are all, in Britain, there are also public schools. Uh, these in public schools don't mean the same thing they mean here. So here they mean obviously schools that are paid for by the government. Public schools in Britain mean sort of the elite schools. Uh, and in a lot of ways you think of it as schools built to trade, train people for working for the public. This really meant to educate wealthier people, wealthier kids, who would become agents of the empire, agents of, of democracy and education and industrialism. And they all got trained for the empire. The empire really was a, a huge thing to the Victorians. Uh, this is the period of massive growth, as I discussed earlier. This brought Britishness around the globe. However, it also exploited millions of people. It entrenched racist ideology that the British people or the white people were better than the others. And that's what we call the white man's burden. 
The White Man's Burden was a poem written by Rudyard Kipling, uh, but it also identifies a lot of the ideas that the British believed of themselves. So we'll talk more about this over the next couple of weeks. Hope this was helpful.